I knew a poet who said, whatever comes into your mind at the beginning of the day when you wake up, that's intending to be the beginning of the poem of that day. Like that idea that each day waking up, we're waking up also to a poem, or we could be. And I woke up this morning thinking not exactly of a poem, but of a song. In this case, an old samba song from Brazil. And the words of the song or the translation goes something like this. It's better to be happy than to be sad. Happiness is the best thing there is. A good samba is a form of prayer. But to make a samba beautiful, you have to remember the sorrow of the world. It is like this to the light of the heart. So that's a beautiful song to me. I learned it from someone, we were in an event, and I was at the time trying to teach 130 people at the same time how to play samba because we were on our way to do like a public ritual and we wanted to have drums and music and song. And I was figured out this way of teaching over 100 people to learn something at the same time. And when it started to sound like samba, the cook came out of the kitchen and said, how do you know samba? He was from Brazil and he was amazed that we were trying to use samba in that way. And so he wanted to join in and he sang the song and then translated it. I'm going to say it again because to me it's beautiful. It's better to be happy than to be sad. Happiness is the best thing there is. A good samba is a form of prayer, but to make a samba beautiful, we have to remember the sorrow of the world. There's a lot of ideas in there. One of them says happiness is a, is a great thing or in the song's uh, sense, the greatest thing, but we can't have that happiness if we don't remember the sorrow of the world. Well, that upends the modern idea that there are positive and negative emotions. It turns out that the emotions travel together. It turns out that if we reject grief, we lose joy. It turns out if we're not willing, especially at this time in the world, in this condition, if we're not willing or able to remember the sorrow of the world, then we also won't have happiness. It also ends with the beautiful idea, it is like this to the light of the heart. It's modern to think that the light of intelligence is coming from the brain, but many ancient people thought the real intelligence of life resides in the heart, that the heart has its own light, and that in the dark times, and I assume everybody got the memo that these are the dark times, in the dark times, we need the light of the heart. So there's a way in which a genuine happiness in life now probably requires a willingness to feel the sorrow of the world. You might call it the sorrow of the earth or the cry of the earth that is re reacting to modern culture um, through the upheaval of climate crisis. And so we're living in a time where climate is in crisis and we're living in a time when culture is in upheaval. And the song is saying, we're gonna have to manage our interest in happiness with our willingness to carry sorrow. So anyway, I like things like that. They give me a sense of poetry that gets to the root of emotion as well as the condition of the world. And they also give me a reminder that to be alive in this world in a meaningful way is to feel the sorrow of those people who don't get food today, that those people that are not just kept out at the borders, but get locked up at the borders, to those people that are also caught in the latest tsunami or the latest hurricane or cyclone, that kind of thing. We know now because of modern communications, what's happening in the world. We hear about a tragedy within 30 seconds of it happening in many cases. That is to say, we are living together the tragedies of the world because we have that information coming in so fast. And so it's important to understand that tragedy is part of human experience, that avoiding tragedy is also clinging to a false innocence. 
And what I mean by that is we're supposed to lose our innocence in terms of just wishing everything would be okay and begin to realize that part of the story can be tragic. It's not necessarily that the end of the story is tragic, but if we reject tragedy in the middle of the story, it will be there in large measure at the end. So part of human responsibility now is to find our way to the happiness and keep in touch with it, but also participate in the understanding and carrying, I guess you could say, the sorrow of the world. So that's where I woke up this morning and um, somehow connected to that. And I don't know how the connection came, but I started thinking about this old teaching story from Africa. And in this case, the little story was used by the elders to teach the younger people how to perceive the world and how to interact with the world. And in this case, they would tell the young people a story about the lions. And so the idea was in the great plains of Africa, the lions are waiting for the herd animals to come along because that's how they get their nourishment. And it turns out that the old lions, like old humans, tend to lose their bite. They actually lose their teeth and they lose their capacity to bite, but they don't lose their roar. And so people, the lions would take the old lions, the elders, I guess we could call, call them, and put them in the tall grass. And then along would come, you know, the herd animals coming into the plains, and the healthy lions are waiting on the opposite side of the plain from where the old lions are waiting in the tall grass. And as the animals come in, let's say the gazelles come in, all of a sudden, the old lions roar with all of their energy and all of their lack of bite. They roar. And when the uh, animals hear the roar, they turn the opposite way and run, and they run right into the healthy lions who are just waiting for their dinner. And so what they're doing is trying to teach the younger people how to understand the world. In other words, this world roars at people and sometimes the smart thing, sometimes the wise thing, sometimes the safe thing is to go towards the roar because in running away from it, we simply get devoured by our own inner demons or devoured by the confusion in the world. So I'm assuming that everybody understands that the world now is in chaos, confusion, and disorder, both at the level of culture and at the level of nature. And that in a way, the world is roaring at us. And maybe the wise thing to do is to go towards the roar. And in the moment, I'm thinking of that roar primarily as the environmental crisis or the climate crisis, as people now call it. The idea being there's a crisis in the world. There's a roaring in the world that's coming from earth and coming from nature demanding that something be done to bring the world back into balance or we may have no world in the future and that's the world roaring at us and it may be wiser and smarter and even ultimately safer to go towards that roar than to run away from it and find ourselves caught in some shadowy place or some disorder and confusion that devours us anyway. I hope this makes sense. This is how I think about things. And so someone asks, well, wait a minute, what does it mean to run towards the roar if you're imagining the roar, particularly, let's say in this sense, as the climate crisis? And I would say one way to imagine that is that we are living in and being invited to participate in a collective rite of passage that instead of just looking at how do I become the best version of myself, which is a responsibility of any per person who begins to awaken, there's also the question of how do we collectively move in a direction that allows us to imagine the next world, to imagine a world that is more connected to beauty and meaning, that is more balanced in terms of culture and nature, that world has to be imagined, but it turns out you can only imagine it when you're willing to move, move towards it without being clear at the beginning of the movement what you're moving towards. 
like the animals, if they ran towards the roar, they wouldn't know where they were going. They wouldn't know what the outcome would be. Although we standing back and looking at the story could see that they might more likely survive if they went towards the roar. And so I've been thinking a lot for a while about collective rites of passage. And one way to consider it is that a group of people begin to realize that the world as we imagine it, the worldview that we have inherited does not work anymore. It doesn't solve most people's problems. And it also, in this case, uh, destroys the ecosystems and things like that. So that it's a worldview that cannot in the long run be life sustaining. And there's an old idea that says that humans come into the world when the life support system of the womb collapses. It's an interesting thing to think about that we are born into this world when the inner womb world that we grow in to begin with no longer works. And then we have to leave that behind and enter the daily world. Well, now we consider that the way we view the world, the womb that we used to be in, that we called the modern world or the Western world or whatever we wanted to call it, no longer works as a sustaining system for either culture or for nature. And so we have to exit in a way from that womb and move towards what seems like the roar, but it is also the direction where we might begin to imagine the next world that is more sustainable and in specifically more inclusive because it involves all of the aspects of nature, all of the animals and all of the ecosystems that are actually we are supposed to be connected to. So in a way, we're like those young people in the ancient African village being advised by the elders, this is a time to run towards the roar. And in a way, we're being asked to do it as a group because it takes the collective imagination of people to imagine a new next worldview.